Um, we have our next uh, renowned uh, speaker, um, Greg Rebetsky. Uh, I'm not going to do big long introductions for the day. I think uh, it's better that we just hear from you. And uh, um, but Greg's um, at CSIRO and uh, graciously given up his day to share with us. So thank you so much, Greg. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And thanks to the organisers for the invitation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I lead our team focusing on wheat and targeting opportunities in G by E by M to reduce cropping risk in future climates. As Charlie highlighted, climate change isn't insidious, but a real feature in adapting to, 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 um, to, to crops into the future. It's highlighted here for Australia, where the, where the Australian Bureau of Meteorology compared rainfall for the period from 2000 to 2021 relative to the period before then, from 1900 to 2000. And what the, the, the graph shows, particularly for the, the wheat belt throughout southern and eastern Australia, was that on average, April to October cropping rainfall will be significant, well, is, has been significantly low, and in some cases the lowest on record, representing a, a significant challenge in ensuring reliable production of our winter cereals. And we have some interesting um, we have insight as to what those future climates um, will be, will be um, understood by or characterised by, and Charlie talked a little bit about that. And I guess from a scientific perspective, most of the focus on adapting to these future climates has been around this concept of resistance to climate change. And we all know about drought resistance, we know about resistance to heat and frost resistance, and there are very, very few examples where we have been successful in modifying crops, adapting crops to, challenging, to challenges in the climate through a focus of resistance. And we often say in wheat that um, drought resistance is highly correlated with yield resistance. And that's because in wheat we're often breeding not for um, extremes in climate, but breeding for average and above average performance, because that's where growers make their money. So in breeding adaptation to changing climates, we have a number of challenges, which I think will highlight, I guess, the issues I have, many others have, around this breeding for resistance. And that, that when we talk about climate change, we're not talking about one single entity. We talk about complex interactions of, of various uh, environmental factors or climatic factors, and their capacity to manage these under control conditions, either in a glass house, a growth cabinet, or in the field, are incredibly challenging in the context of the reality of the changes ahead. We know that trait-based breeding works very, very well when there's a long-term reliable signal, and Charlie highlighted some of the evidence for that in the context of a changing climate in maize. And I guess in terms of, in terms of wheat in Australia, um, that signal and its relationship with TPE is absolutely critical in testing and establishing the value of traits when we move away from control conditions into the field. One thing we are concerned about in Australia is that while we do see an incremental signal in increasing CO2 and its impact on adaptation through, through heat, um, we also see significant variability. So while there is this reliably incremental change in CO2, we're also presented in Australia particularly some of the most variable climates over the last 20 years. In fact, through southern Australia, we have received every decile of rainfall over the past 10 years, from decile one, less than 10% of rain, through to decile 10. So in this context of increasing drought and high temperature, the variability which drives the signal for breeders from which they can select is incredibly, incredibly uh, dynamic and challenging. So the question is, in breeding, how much of the forecast is predictable? across long breeding cycle time spans. And so my challenge is that do we need to change our thinking away from hundreds, 100 years of farming in historically reliable rainfall rainfed systems and perhaps think a bit more about breeding and developing cropping systems that contain crop varieties that are probably more opportunistic than resist against climate change. 
In that sense, can we do a better job of directing the G, the genotype in G by E by M, with new and existing management or systems to reduce risk and provide grower opportunity in variable climates expected into the future? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the traits my, my, I and my team have been working on around playing the seasons. And I talk about opportunity breeding to provide for greater in-crop flexibility. And these focus on establishment, vegetative growth, and flowering. So the first trait I'll talk about is optimising crop establishment. And I talked about how BOM had indicated significant change in rain over the last 20 years. 2024 represents the driest March-April over the past 130 years in the southern and western wheat belt. We've got parts of West Australia that have not had rain for seven months. In targeting reliable establ germination establishment, this provides a significant risk with growers targeting the uh, establishment of their crops. Here's an example for Southern Cross on the eastern edge of the West Australian wheat belt contrasting pre and post 2000 rainfall. And what you can see is that pre 2000, we saw very much a normal distribution of rain commencing April when the crops are typically sown. But since that time, we've seen a significant shift in rainfall away from that reliable April, May, June to a focus on summer rainfall. And it's this summer rainfall which becomes important to a grower. How can we make use of that rainfall that has fallen, fallen and has been managed well over the summer? Now, growers um, do dry sow. They sow into um, dry soil to a depth of around three centimetres. But it's very risky. Uh, the, the moisture in that top three to five centimetres is highly variable. And when you dry sow, you run the risk of up to six weeks delay in germination. And with that variability in crop development and the agronomy that sits around that crop development, but also in the uh, management of, of weeds, which are a significant issue when you have um, poor germination, poor establishment and poor early growth. The fact that, or the feature of the plant that drives our ability to sow deep into that summer moisture that's now sitting at 10 to 15 centimetres is the coleoptile. It's a modified leaf, and that modified leaf links the seed, or shoot is a shoot that links the seed to the soil surface. And the length of the coleoptile determines the depth at which seed can be sown. There are two sets of genes that affect coleoptile length. There's a larger cell and faster growth rate gene, which is a, effectively a leaf growth gene. And a number of QTLs have been identified across the genome. Some work from one of our GWAS populations these, are, these QTL are, are very, very small effect QTL. But probably what is more, um, more important, I guess, in determining the length of the coleoptile are the dwarfing genes. The genes associated with the Green Revolution that reduce plant height. And since the adoption of the Green Revolution dwarfing genes back in 1960, coleoptile length was known to be significantly reduced and significantly compromised our ability to sow crops deeper when chasing deep moisture or chasing deeper soils to avoid high soil temperatures. Uh, a grower once said to me, these dwarfs couldn't push the skin of a, of a rice pudding. And it's largely because these dwarfing genes are linked to um, reduced endogenous cell, sensi cell sensitivity. Gibberellic acid is responsible for elongation of the cell, both in the leaf but also in the coleoptile. And uh, some work from Cornell showed quite nicely using near isogenic sets of lines for, for these different dwarfing genes, how increases, oh, sorry, increases in the frequency of GAN sensitive dwarfing genes was linked to a linear reduction in cell length. We've been looking all over the world for alternative sources of reduced height, and these include some of these gibberellic acid or gibberellin responsive dwarfing genes and identified a suite of these genes which we have then brought into Australia and have been testing for the last 20 years to establish their impact or their effect on um, reductions in coleoptile length. And we can see in green there are a number of these different dwarfing genes largely arising out of the Cold War and mutagenesis programs used to justify um, increased um, investment in, uh, in, in, in nuclear technologies. 
But some good is coming out of that work. And so we've been looking very closely at these different dwarfing genes. We've been looking at their influence on, on agronomic performance and also looking at their influence on coleoptile length. And one feature that's associated with the increase in coleoptile length is the rate of coleoptile elongation. Here undertaken under um, green light conditions where we can regularly monitor repeated sampling of coleoptile length and from the, that establish coleoptile elongation rates and very much establishing that the, the GA responsive dwarfing genes both have longer coleoptiles and that's largely through their increased coleoptile elongation rate relative to the green revolution genes. The gene we've most focused on has been RHT18, which is a GA2 oxidase, which we imported from Italy out of a Dura mutagenesis program. We've back crossed that dwarfing gene through the development of um, gene-based markers into a range of genetic backgrounds, made that material available to breeders who are now using or commercializing some of these lines. Our first assessment of these neuroisogenic pairs the original varieties, Asparta, Gregory, Mace, Magenta, Scout, Yipi, containing the GA insensitive Green Revolution dwarfing gene replaced with the RHT18 dwarfing gene and showing that under these conditions, these are back cross three lines, so around 93% adapted um, background, common background. We're seeing on average around a 35% increase in coleoptile length simply by replacing the coleoptile elongation reducing RHT2 with the GA response coleoptile elongating RHT18. We've, we've moved this into the field. As part of that move, we've been working with growers to modify the technology so we could uh, reliably achieve deep sowing up to 15 centimetres. Um, some points here um, in WA just showing depths down to 15. And then we've been moving some of this genetic and comparing this across multiple field sites. This, one, this slide here just shows for one particular site the performance of our long coleoptile um, RHT18 wheats against the known tall standard halberd against some, some uh, commercial GA insensitive dwarfing short, medium and mid-long wheats. And very much this increase in coleoptile length is closely in linked to changes or increases in ceiling emergence. This year we've um, moved, oh, let me go back. Um, we've undertaken trials this year, 2024, a very, very dry year. No rain, and no rain since um, November. And at a number of sites, we've looked at uh, shallow, dry sowing, typical of what a grower would do, versus deep sowing where we did have moisture at um, 10 or 12 centimetres. And you can see here for two sites, Corrigan and Montagin, this is two of around nine sites we have, just showing that by sowing deep into that moisture, we have good emergence. And only just last week did we get our first rain. So those crops sown at 10 centimetres um, have emerged, established. They're around three and a half leaves. They ran 40 centimetres of root growth compared to the dry sown crops at four centimetres, which are now only, only in our emerging. And the danger with that is the, well, firstly, by having a reduced biomass above ground, we, we fall, we, we have reduced your potential, reduced tillering, we have reduced capacity to compete with weeds, and we have reduced capacity to also access deep moisture. The other important feature of this is when we develop varieties that are suited to a particular adaptation, if a variety's been uh, developed for sowing mid-April, it doesn't germinate and emerge until late May the genetics around flowering are pushed three weeks later into the season. So you get that double whammy of reduce your potential by reduced biomass, but also you're flowering later into that very hot dry finish. So any yield potential you do achieve is at risk of being of low quality because of those hot dry finishes owing to the genetics which have predisposed your adaptation for an optimal flowering time, which is now three weeks later. The genetics have been moved into hands of growers this is a farmer we work with, uh, 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 Callum Wesley, just showing him on the right. And this is just an experiment showing deep sown long coleoptile mace at 120 millimetres on the left, four weeks um, earlier emerging, 
and growing compared to the Mace 18 sown shallow. And you can see at flowering just how well these crops have performed. And particularly you can see just how that late emergence for the line on the far right has delayed flowering and is likely to contribute to reduced yield. That double whammy of reduced biomass through redu and reduced yield potential, but not only that, reduced uh, quality. And Callum's quite excited by this. Um, in 2020, when this trial was grown, it was a decile one year with 76 mils of in-crop rainfall. We had 105 millimetres of January rainfall, so there was moisture there at depth. Based on calculated water use efficiencies, we achieved very, very high water use efficiencies. Unrealistically high, because we failed to account for the capacity for that extra root growth and capacity to access deep moisture. He was coming out of a, part, uh, out of a, a pulse crop, so we knew that there was moisture at depth. So by germinating early, we get capacity for more biomass above ground, but capacity to take advantage of that deep moisture. Roots grow 1.1 centimetres per day from germination to flowering. So imagine what another four weeks will do in terms of another 30, 35 centimetres of root growth. Importantly, Callum's comment to us was ensuring a crop with these new genetics two out of three years compared with one in three now. So in terms of risk, this is a key trait for him. We've been working with the breeding programs and with grower groups and then using data from side-by-side -side comparisons of our genetics established a mean yield benefit of around 20% in the use of long coleoptile genetics in future climates. Realisation of around $2 to $2.2 billion yield benefit just for wheat alone in future climates. The traits also being taken up by other groups. Um, we're seeing um, soil ameliorations becoming a big feature in burying herbicide resistant weeds, burying uh, um, non-wetting soils. Those fluffy soils when sown into establish poorly because the sowing depth is so variable. But by having a long coleoptile wheat takes out some of that variability, providing the growers following soil amelioration with some insurance to ensure good emergence. And the technology is now being moved into other crops. So we're, we're taking this idea, this capacity deep sow into canola. Variety A here is um, performing well deep and shallow compared to variety B, which is performed poorly with deep sowing. And we're releasing varieties. So as part of our public pre-breeding pipeline, we're also delivering germplasm. It's quite exciting. So that gets us around establishment and this key phase, this critical phase of getting crops away early, particularly that time of the year when moisture is absolutely critical, but probably um, a little more variable climatically. There are other aspects of delayed rainfall that can also impact on a grower's decision to, to uh, exploit G in, in, as part of the wider G by E by M package. And so the focus of ours has been around, once the crop is emerged, can we improve vegetative vigour? We call it high early, biome, high early vigour. And we, we're focusing here on late sowing and weed competitiveness. Growers sow three to 5,000 hectares through southern and western Australia. The program is so large. And so you start sowing middle of April and then you plant for six weeks. If the rain doesn't come, or if there are issues along the way, there's a force or pressure for growers to plant later. And we've been looking at, is there capacity in modifying our system under these, situ under these conditions to look at late sowing? Growers do a little bit of this, but they usually sow barley. Barley is very, very vigorous. Unfortunately, barley doesn't have the same value of wheat as wheat. And so we've been looking at late sowing as an option in our program for, for a number of reasons, but you know, particularly around late sowing break rains, managing herbicide resistant weeds using double knock herbicides. So these are knockdown herbicides which are much cheaper but also much more effective in controlling herbicide resistant weeds. Um, issues around frost risk, double cropping, and in large parts of WA, waterlogged soils. These are anoxic soils that we, we get a deluge of rain, that rain subsides uh, late July, early August. Crops fail to recover if sown before that uh, rain. So is there capacity to actually delay sowing on those duplex soils and take advantage of these more vigorous crops? Um, the benefits, I guess, uh, 
are shown in this slide here, or I guess the disadvantages, I guess, are, sh are being shown here. Two crops side by side um, on the the west on the South Australian Mallee, Calibre opportunistically sown 25th of May, dry sown, really good crop. Calibre sown late July, doesn't have the capacity to build biomass and also flowers later. The growers in these areas would love something that has the right phenology right, and also has the capacity for, for high biomass so they can look at sowing post July. So we've been undertaking an S12 recurrent selection program based on around 30 wheats from around the world. This is around 20 years. Trying to build the biomass in wheat from what is effectively a highly conservative growth crop to, to something that mimics more the early vigor and biomass of barley. And so you can see uh, our success in terms of uh, development of cycle six lines over this um, six cycles now of recurrent selection. And the slide on the left just shows the sort of biomass that we're talking about in terms of our advanced cycle lines compared to current rise on the right. We're still collecting data on late sowing. Um, we have a number of trials across the country. Our simulation does highlight there is real potential for having some flexibility in having high vigor wheats across um, for, for, a, for a range of situations. So we're quite excited. And then the other benefit around another G by E by M really is around weed suppression. And what we do find with our high vigor genetics, they have this capacity to not only build higher biomass above ground to re reduce light to growing weeds, they also have this suppression capacity below ground. That work's being published now. So we're finding a, a G by E by M opportunity purely around weed competitiveness and maintain the life of existing chemistries, actives, but also reducing the cost to growers of herbicides. My final example of G by E by M wheat is really around reducing financial risk. And it's really around the development of grain and gray ornless wheats for frost prone regions. Frost has a significant impact on wheat. So much so, many parts of the Australian wheat belt, wheat is no longer grown, favoring canola and oats. The issue with canola and oats is the, the cost and the reliability of production, but also the development of herbicide resistance, because there's very limited herbicides for, for these. So having wheat in the system would provide growers with a systems benefit around access to new herbicides, but also benefits around uh, financial or, or de-risking uh, finance. The, the, the value of frost can be significant. Um, I think uh, estimated nationally around $400 million per year. But in certain years, here for example in West Australia, we can see evidence where frost in certain years can cause significant costs. One to two million tonnes in 2021 compared to two million tonnes in 2016. So removing awns, that's the little beard structure that, that um, sits or grows um, from the wheat head, can have a significant impact on the quality of the wheat for, for hay. Um, awns pierce the jowls of sheep and, and racehorses, and so removing them increases the value of a frosted crop significantly. We have been developing um, new genetics that contain or have, have removed these awns, but in doing so also maintaining the high quality that wheat needs in order to develop a, a, a variety that can be used in the event of significant frost. We have varieties now in, in place, but in the absence of a frost or a high temperature event, we can also um, sell that crop as a high value lean quality wheat. And um, here are a couple of, uh, of these wheat varieties, Bale and Dual, and we have another one currently in the pipeline with another breeding company. So I guess my point here is that as a pre-breeding entity, we can do really good science and deliver impact in our science, but there also is some capacity with the right genetics and the right pipeline to deliver elite varieties. So in conclusion, I hope I've uh, made it clear that I think Climate variability will be a significant challenge in Australia in breeding rain-fed crops. I also want to highlight that growers probably know a little bit more about their systems than we do. 
We just need to provide them with the tools so they can think a little bit more around the opportunity, around their region, around their year, and around their system. Providing growers with these tools allows them to play the season while minimising production, financial and environmental risk. The genetics I've talked about is novel. They don't sit within Australian wheat breeding programs. In fact, for me, the traits, they don't sit anywhere in the world. But it's taken a physiological model underpinned by good statistical genetics to actually try and build the germplasm and the genetic base in which we can move some of these traits um, into the hands of, of growers, or through, of breeders, I should say, through the development and delivery of elite back cross or top cross lines. And just finally, um, I've talked about three traits. Um, there are other traits which we have in the pipeline as well that have been successful, others that have been less successful. Um, but importantly, it's maintaining these close links with growers and close links with commercial breeders, which have really forged our ability to, to move these traits along, but also understand the value and where, where the, um, the opportunity sits uh, with new traits through our pre-breeding pipeline. So that's a bit of a, a thumbnail sketch of, of what we've been doing, just a number of people to acknowledge. And I just want to highlight, we link very closely with grower groups and growers and also with plant breeders. I think growers provide us with many of the ideas we need and many of the opportunities, but also very, very supportive in funding. The breeders are very good because they tell us what we do bad, what we do wrong, and so there's learnings there. With that, are there any questions? Thanks, Greg. Um, congratulations on those achievements. It's, it's really you. impressive, you know. Yeah, well done. Uh, just really short questions um, from anybody? It's Craig, I'm guessing, is it? No? Jonathan. John. Really cool. From the idea of planting deeper and GA responsiveness and, and aspects like that, have you thought about also linking that with a bacterial um, inoculation because PGPRs will also release GA? No, 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 we haven't. We haven't. We've, I guess, been focusing on what we can do from a genetic perspective first up. And I guess at some point we, we will bring in other opportunities. Um, seed priming, um, I guess, seed priming using GA as part of the seed priming. There are other, other features which we, which we could include. Um, the GA insensitive wheat we tend to find are highly non responsive, even with seed size. So I think we're, f we're pretty much limited as how far we can push that system without getting the genetics right. And so I think, yeah, the GA responsive is probably the way going forward, but it'd be good to have a chat with you afterwards about that. All right, well, um, thank you again, Greg. That's really oh. beautiful. Thank you.